Okay, what is the name of the Torah portion? Vayishlach, and what does that mean? And he sent, the question is, did Jacob send messengers or did Jacob send angels or what? Now, before we begin, I'm going to start with the Haftorah, though, not the Torah. And I want to start with how many of you heard the comment, do unto others as you would have them do unto you? Where is that found in your Bible? Well, guess what? Everything in the New Testament is found in the Old Testament. Yay. Uh, we're going to look at the Haftor, which is the book of Obadiah, which is really a condemnation against Esau. Amalek descended from Esau, and this is a condemnation because of all their violence. And the Hebrew word for violence is Hamas. Look at Obadiah 1, 10 through 12. <clears throat> it says, because of your Hamas, your violence against your brother Jacob, shame is going to cover you. You'll be cut off forever in the day that you stood on the other side. This is talking about when Nebuchadnezzar came to destroy Jerusalem. Okay, Babylon, uh, the army is destroying everything. And they didn't try to help their brother. They stood on the other side. It says, in the very day that the strangers carried away your brother captive with his forces and foreigners entered into his gates, they cast lots on Jerusalem even you, Esau, was as one of the enemies of Jacob. You should not have looked on the day of your brother in the day he became a stranger. Neither should you have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither should you have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Can you imagine here Esau, Jacob's brother, is rejoicing when he was taken captive. Look at what is happening in the world today. There's fringe left groups who express support for Hamas's invasion and their brutal attacks on Israel. This is in New York. All these people are partying because of the brutality of the attack on Israel. That is just insane. Look at Obadiah 1, 14 and 15. Neither should you have stood in the crossway. The crossway is where the... Judeans are fleeing to get away from Babylon, and they stood in the crossway to cut off those that were trying to escape. Neither should you have then delivered up those who were trying to escape, uh, you know, in the day of distress. And then it talks about today. It says, for the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen, as you have done, it will be done unto you. Your reward will return upon your own head. Uh, well, I guess uh, there's a lot of people that have been rejoicing over the destruction of Israel, and their reward is coming. <clears throat> so this Torah portion, uh, what we're going to cover here is how Jacob and his family are leaving uh, his father-in-law, Laban. He ends up wrestling with somebody. Is it a man? Is it an angel? Is it God? Then he confronts Esau, and then after that, he's off to Shechem or Shechem, when he really should have headed straight to Mount Moriah, because that's where he said he would go when he returns and build an altar there. This is when Dinah is raped, and then they leave Shechem and head off to Hebron, but they make a stop at the Temple Mount, and then as they get to Bethlehem, Rachel dies, Isaac dies, all in this Torah portion. <clears throat> now, here's the other thing. How old is Jacob when he's wrestling the angel? He's 97 years old. Can you imagine? He's a 97-year-old man, and he's trying to wrestle with either God or an angel or a messenger. And then Jacob sends, we begin with uh, Genesis 32.3. Jacob sends messengers before him to Esau's brother to the land of Seir, which is the country of Edom. And then in verse 6, the messengers returned and said, hey, we've got great news. We came to Esau, and he's coming to meet you with 400 soldiers. Ah, 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 you can see he's scared to death. <clears throat> and then in verse 7, it says, Jacob was not just afraid, he was greatly afraid, even distressed. So he divides the people that were with him in two, and the flocks, and the herds, and the camels into two bands. One of the big problems that I see is Jacob always operates out of fear. He allows fear to control 
his response. He doesn't ask God what he should do. If you remember, when he fled from his brother Esau, 20 years earlier, God had already promised him that he would return safely. <clears throat> and so we see in Genesis 31, 41, he's been gone 20 years. He says to his father-in-law, Laban, look, I've, 20 years I've been in your house. I served you 14 years for your two daughters, six years for your flock, and you kept changing my paycheck. And then in verse 22 through 25 of Genesis 32, and I want you to pay close attention to the wording here. It says, Jacob rose up that night and took his how many wives? Two wives and his two women servants or concubines. So uh, Bilhah and Zilpah aren't considered wives. They're considered the concubines. And he also has his 11 sons because Benjamin is not born yet. They pass over the little fjord Jabbok, and he took them, and he sent them over the brook, and he sent over all that he had, and then Jacob was left all alone. And then it says, there he wrestled a man until the breaking of the day. It says there wrestled a man with him. It's like the man picked the fight. It's not like Jacob picked the fight, but this man, it says, wrestled with Jacob. How many of you men have ever been involved in wrestling? I took a wrestling class. You're exhausted after about 10 or 20 minutes if it's uh, really a good wrestling match. He's been doing it all night long. He's been wrestling. And, and what's amazing uh, is he, he's 97 years old. And uh, it says, when he saw, this is the angel saw that, or the man saw he couldn't prevail against Jacob, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. <sighs> okay, we saw he had two wives. How many of you know that's not a good idea to begin with? <laughs> that's probably where he learned his wrestling. <laughs> okay, what do we find 220 years later in the Torah? we find something about this incident. Listen, it says, if a man has two wives, one loved, the other hated, and they bore him children, both the beloved and the hated, and if the firstborn son be hers that was hated, then it will be when he makes his sons to inherit that what he has, he may not make the son of the beloved be firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. Wow, don't you think that had something to do with what happened 220 years earlier? Well, there's another verse I'm going to show you that will blow you away in a little bit. But let's go back to our portion here. In Hosea 12, 2 through 4, talking about Jacob and Judah, it says the Lord has a controversy with Judah, and he will punish Jacob. Well, the interesting thing is it doesn't say he has a controversy with the heathen. He never has a controversy with the heathen. His controversy is always with his own people. And it says he's going to punish Jacob according to his ways. Who knows what Jacob, his name means? What is Jacob supplanter? It's really heel grabber. Heel grabber. Because what did he do? It says right here. He took his brother by the heel into the womb. And then it says by his strength, he had power with God. He wept and cried to him. And he had power over the angel and over Cain. Well, did he have wrestle with a man? Did he wrestle with God? Did he wrestle with an angel? Well, the Hebrew word for angel can also mean messenger, okay? And what's fascinating is I believe here he did wrestle with a man who was a messenger, who was God, and his name is Yeshua. That's who he wrestled with. Now, watch this, and I'll show you why. In Genesis 32, 26 through 30, Man, but people get in a fight over a lot of things. But this fight was over if Jacob would be blessed. <laughs> he got in a fight with his angel and says, I ain't letting go until you bless me. And he wouldn't let go. He said, the angel said, let me go for the day breaks. And he said, I'm not going to let you go except you bless me. And so look how he's going to bless him. He says, what's your name? And he said, he'll grab her. And he said, your name will no longer be hill grabber, but Israel, for as a prince, you've had power with God. So who was he wrestling with? And then it says, end with men, and you prevailed. And so then Jacob says, well, tell me, what's your name? 
And he said, why are you asking me for my name? And so all he did was bless him. And Jacob called the name of that place Peniel, which means the face of God. He says, for I've seen God face to face and my life is preserved. So it tells me he was wrestling with God. Now, when you think of the priestly blessing, he says, not only will I bless you, but I will put my name on you. The way he got blessed was by receiving a new name. Okay, well, then uh, let me ask you this, though. He had received the blessing from his father Isaac, right, to get everything. Why does he need another blessing? Why, why is he asking this guy, whoever this stranger is for a blessing, unless this person happened to be someone who had the ability to bless, all right? Well, the other thing is this. Only the owner can change the name. Who names your kids, you or your neighbor? When you picked a name for your kids, did you ask the neighbor to name that kid? This proves it was God because only the owner can change the name of his own. Do you follow me? For this angel to give him a new name, that means he had to have the authority to change his name. Okay, now look at Revelation 3.12. Look at a blessing that's coming. To him that overcomes, I'll make a pillar in the temple of my God. He'll go no more out. I will write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down from heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. And look at Revelation 2.17. Whoever has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the hidden manna. I'll give him a white stone, and in the stone, a new name written who nobody knows but the one who receives it. Wow. So a blessing and a new name is tied together, and only the owner can change the name. And the word Israel means to struggle with God. So it went from heel grabber to struggler with God, which proves, again, it was God. <clears throat> okay, then we find in Genesis 33, 4. Esau runs to meet him, embraces him, and fell on his neck and kissed him and wept. Well, let me show you something about this kiss. Okay, who can tell me what letter this is over here? Anyone speak English? T, the letter T. Okay, what is that letter? Tav, that's the letter Tav. And what is that letter? Tet, they both make the T sound, right? Now, here's another one in Hebrew. I mean, why would you think in English we have one letter that makes T? How many do you need? In Hebrew, there's two letters that make the T sound. That means the numerical value in the picture has a lot to do with its importance. The other letter is the kof and the kuf. They both make the K sound, like bach, okay, or back. So that is the K or C8 sound. Well, here's what's fascinating. You don't see this in English. You only see it in Hebrew. When it says that Esau went up and kissed him, this is the word and kissed him. But notice these are not vowel points. These are little diamonds that are above each individual letter, which is nowhere else in the Torah. But why is it there? What does it represent? Now, the root word is usually a two-letter root word for every word, and the two letters are the shin and the kuf. Do you see that? Now, how many of you have heard the word bark? What does bark mean? A tree, you have a bark on a tree, and you got dogs barking. It's the same word, but it has two different meanings. Well, guess what? If you take that word for kiss, and the shin and the kuf, if you change it to the shin and the cough, which makes the very same sound, it means to bite. So did Esau bite him on the neck or did he kiss him on the neck? Phonetically, it could be either way. And some say it was to bite and those are the teeth marks in his neck. That's what it represents, which I thought was fascinating. 
So his kiss was fake, much like Judas Iscariot. When he came and gave Yeshua a kiss, it was totally fake. <clears throat> now, in, Ju uh, uh, in Genesis 33, 18, Jacob comes in peace to the city of Shechem, or Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padanaram and camped before the city. Where was he supposed to go? He was supposed to go to Bethel. But he tarried, and he went this way instead, and it just gets him into trouble. It says in Genesis 33, 19, and 20, for just 100 bits of money he got from the children of Hamor, the builder of Shechem, the field in which he had put his tents. And he also built up an altar, naming it El, uh, for the God of Israel. So I've been to Israel many, many times, and uh, we're... Uh, up where Itamar is, and we're looking at Shechem. So Shechem is not, or Shechem isn't only a place, it's a person's name. And so this is between these two hills. Who knows what the name of the two hills are? Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. These are the two where all the tribes, when they came in, were on either side, and the Levites were in the middle, and they were yelling out the blessings and the cursings back and forth. Remember that? Okay, well, Shechem is right there in the middle of those places. Now, Shechem is a person, and what's his dad's name? Hamor. Okay, Hamor means a male donkey. So, hi, I'm the son of jackass. How are you doing? You know, it's, okay. Well, look at this. It says in Genesis 36, 2, what's fascinating it says, Esau took his wives of the daughter of Canaan, Ada, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and Aholibama, the daughter of Ana, the daughter of Zibion, the what? Hivite. So Hamor and Shechem are Hivites, right? Well, Esau married into the Hivite family, and it's the Hivites that Simeon and Levi kill. Wow, they're killing relatives. Look at Genesis 34, 1 and 2. It says, now Dina or Dinah, the daughter whom Leah had by Jacob, went out to see the women of the country. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, who was the chief of that land, saw her, he took her by force and had connection with her. All right, well, look at Genesis 34, 5. Jacob heard of what Shechem had done to his daughter, but his sons were out working in the field, the cattle, and Jacob didn't say anything until they came. And then look at chapter 34, verse 11 through 16. Shechem said to Jacob, her father, and to her brothers, hey, if you will give ear to my request, whatever you say, I'll give to you. However great you make the bride price and payment, I'll give it. Only let me have the girl for my wife. But the sons of Jacob gave a false answer to Shechem and Hamor's father because of what they had done to Dinah, their sister. And they said, it's not possible for us to give our sister to one who isn't circumcised, for that would be a cause of shame to us. But on this condition only will we come to an agreement with you. If every male among you becomes like us and undergoes circumcision, then we'll give our daughters to you and take your daughters for us and go on living with you as one people. I think it's interesting, there was no mention of money, but on the other side of it, you would think Hamor and Shechem would at least let the men decide about that deal, you know, of what they have coming. But what do we see in Genesis 34, 18 through 22? It says, and their words were pleasing to Hamor and his son Shechem, and without a loss of time, the young man did as they said, because he had delight in Jacob's daughter, here he rapes this little girl, and he's the noblest one in the whole house. I hate to see the other ones. Then Hamor and Shechem, his son, went to the meeting place of their town, and they said to the men of the town, it is the desire of these men to be at peace with us. Let them go on living in the country and doing trade, for the country is wide open before them. Let us take their daughters. Well, they only have one, Dinah, and she's just been taken. So I don't know how many other daughters they were thinking about. But... Then they say, let us give them our daughters. Only therein will the men consent to us to dwell with us, to be one people, if every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised. 
Well, obviously, there was a great hesitation among the men. They weren't so sure about the circumcision part. So, in Genesis 34, 23, Hamor and Shechem add this. Wow, won't their cattle then be our and their goods and all their beasts belong to us? So let us come to agreement with them so we may go on living with us. And then in verse 24, all the men of the town said, yay, let's do it. And every male in the town underwent circumcision. Okay, now I want to show you uh, my chart I have here, just to show you what's going on. Okay, um, in the year 2205 from Adam, uh, Jacob has finished working with the livestock. He's 97 year old. He wrestles uh, with an angel. And then th uh, three years later here in 160, this is when Simeon and Levi slay all of Shechem, and the Levites, but I want you to see something here. Yeah, I was gonna, I have here that Isaac thought he was gonna die, he lives another 43 years. But here's what's fascinating, I want you to see this chart. This is the chart of the ages of all the kids when the events happened. So right here, Reuben was only 13 years old when they left Laban, okay? If you remember, it's quite easy math. He was there for how many years? How long was Jacob with Laban? 20 years. That's what we just read, 20 years. Well, he didn't have any kids the first six years, right? That leaves 14 years. It takes nine months to have a baby. And when they left, that makes Reuben 13 years old. You follow me? Okay. Simeon and Levi were only 16 and 15 years old when they killed all the Hivites. They were just 16 and 15 years old. Okay? Naphtali and Dan and Gad and Asher, the other uh, wise kids, were 12 through 14. So they're the ones who went in and looted everything after Simeon and Levi killed them. When they sold Joseph... Reuben was 24 and Joseph was 17. But here's what I want to show you. When they killed the Hivites because they raped their sister Dinah, Dinah was only 10 years old. Dinah was only 10 years old when Shechem raped her. And that's why her brothers said, we're going to get you. So I just wanted you to see that. So uh, yeah, Dinah was 10. Okay, so now moving on here. So what happens? It says in Genesis 34, 29, what did Jacob's kids do? They took all their wealth, they took all their little ones, and they took their wives and made them captive and spoiled even all that was in the house. Okay, now I'm going to make you all of a sudden realize something here in just a moment. Do you remember what we just got done reading about if someone has two wives, but how 220 years earlier the event happened, and then it says, okay, let's you know, make sure that this is the way it's handled. Let's look at Deuteronomy 21, 10 through 13. If you remember, Simeon and Levi just went to war against the Hivites, right? Look what it says. When you go forth to war against your enemies and the Lord your God has delivered them into your hands and you've taken them captive and you see among the captives a beautiful woman and have a desire unto her that you would have her to wife, then you will bring her home to your house. She'll shave her head, pare her nails. She'll put away the raiment of her captivity from off her and will remain in your house and bewail her father and her mother a full month. After that, you can go into her and be your husband and she'll be your wife. Guess what? I believe all these wives became their wives. If you notice, there is no name given of any of the tribe's wives. Reuben's wife's name isn't mentioned. Simeon's wife isn't mentioned. None of them are mentioned. The only one who hasn't mentioned is Joseph when he married Asenath from Egypt. I will bet you because of this phrase that all of the Israelites, there are no Jews for them to marry. And so they had to marry Gentiles. And so I'll bet you more than anything, they had those Hivites that they had taken captive ended up becoming their wives. There were no other Jews. Okay, with that thought, let's move on. 
And look at Genesis 34, 31. 30 and 31. Jacob says to Simeon and Levi, you've troubled me to make me odious to the inhabitants of the land, even to the Canaanites and the parasites and the parasites, something. And I being few in number, they're going to gather themselves together against me and smite me and I'll be destroyed. I in my house. And they said, should one deal with our sister as with a harlot? Notice they didn't say with your daughter. It's no, with our sister. You may not consider her your daughter, but she is our sister. You know, just like Leah was the unfavored one compared to Rachel. And so in Genesis 35, 1, God says to Jacob, uh, it's time to get out of here. Let's go up to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar to God that appeared to you when you fled from the face of your brother Esau. And so we find out he's, he's moving out of town. And then Jacob says to his household and all that who were with him, put away the strange gods that are among you. Why did he say that? They took all of the idols out of Shechem. They took the wives. They took the little ones. They took all their idols with them. And God says, get rid, or Jacob says, get rid of all the idols because we're going to go up to the altar of the temple that we're going to be built for God and it's holy. But guess what? I don't think Rachel gave up her God that she had stolen from Laban. And we find she ends up dying. Fascinating. And so it says, uh, they gave to Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. You go back to Abraham's day a couple hundred years earlier. It was at the oak of Shechem that Abraham first came into the land and where he made a vow to God. And I believe this was the same place. And then it says they journeyed, and the terror of God was on all the cities that were around them. I can just see that. Man, them teenagers are crazy. Stay away. And they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. Now, Genesis 35, 10 through 12. And again, here we see this was God who he wrestled with. Because God says to him, your name is Jacob. Your name will not be called anymore Jacob. The reason why I say this is among Judaism, they believe he wrestled with the spirit of Esau. There is no way he could have wrestled with the spirit of Esau. Esau had no authority to change his brother's name. Okay? He says, Israel will be your name, and he called his name Israel. This shows you it was God who he was wrestling with. And God said to him, I'm El Shaddai. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations will be of you. Kings will come out of your loins and the land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac, to you I will give it, and to your seed after you I will give the land. And then in Genesis 35, 16 through 18, we see Ephrat, it's the same name for Bethlehem, which is a couple of miles past the Temple Mount. And it says, Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor, and it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said to her, don't fear, you're going to have this son also. And it came to pass, as her soul was departing, for she died, she called her son's name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. Benoni means son of my trouble, son of my sorrow. And Benjamin means son of my right hand. Well, I think this is fascinating because they're both correct. Benoni, the son of my sorrow, referred to Yeshua's first coming, and son of my right hand refers to his second coming. Uh, and uh, Benjamin, uh, in one sense, is a sign of Messianic believers because he never betrayed his brother, Joseph, also. Well, what do we see? Rachel never gets to meet Isaac because she dies before they get to Hebron. And we see in Genesis 35, 19 through 21, Rachel dies. She was buried uh, by Ephrat, which is Bethlehem. Jacob set up a pillar, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. And then Israel journeyed and spread his tent beyond the Tower of Edar, well, what does Rachel's name mean in Hebrew? A lamb. She's a lamb. And <clears throat> what do we see? Jacob is mourning the death of his precious lamb in Bethlehem. Okay. Well, he pitched his tent at the watchtower for the flocks where the Levitical shepherds would watch over another precious lamb that will be born in Bethlehem that will comfort Jacob, called Yeshua. Now, do you remember how Zilpah and Bilhah were not considered wives, but concubines? Well, look what this says. 
It came to pass, okay, Rachel just died. And it says, while Israel was dwelling in the land, that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. And Israel heard it, and now the sons of Jacob were 12. Well, look what happens in Genesis 37 too. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, being still a lad, even with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's what? Wives. Once Rachel and Leah died, Bilhah and Zilpah became his wives. So this tells us Leah also died at this time. Not just Rachel, Leah has died, and now they both become his wives. Now, why did Reuben lay with Bilhah? First off, Reuben was 17 years old when he did that. And why did he do that? Because he was tired of Rachel getting favor over his mom, Leah. He knew Bilhah was going to become his wife and wanted to defile her before he did, so he would prefer Zilpah over Bilhah. Craziness, huh? Okay. And then in Genesis 35, 29, Isaac gave up the ghost and he died and he was gathered to his people, being old and full of days, and his sons Esau and Jacob had come together to bury him. But Joseph's been missing for 12 years at this time. Now, in Exodus 1, 7, it says, the children of Israel were fruitful, increased abundantly, multiplied, waxed exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Okay, I also did the math there. How many went into Egypt? It tells you how many children of Jacob went into Egypt. Do anyone remember? 70. And that's why they would sacrifice 70 bulls for all the nations of the world. They came in at 70. And when you go to the book of Numbers and you see and add up how many came out, it says only the males, 20 years old and up, were 605,000. But when you add all the women and the children, there's over a million. And they actually say there was about two and a half million that came out of Exodus. So in just 220 years, they went from 70 to a couple of million. That is a lot of reproduction. Okay, here we go. We're going to end this part with this. This is a timeline, and it's one year timeline at a time. And so it's the year 2206 from Adam. Jacob's 98 years old, Isaac is 158, and the years go by. It was in 2209 when they killed all the Hivites, and Reuben was only 17, and it's also the same time he defiled Bilhah. And then Judah, after the sale of Joseph, goes, runs off and marries a Canaanite, and a couple of years go by, and so we go to the next seven years. Isaac's now 172, Jacob's 112, seven years go by. Here, Isaac is 179, Jacob is 119, Joseph's 28 in prison, and then here, Isaac is 180, and Isaac dies. Jacob is 120, Joseph is 29, and then when Joseph is 30, he's released from prison, and this is when the seven years of prosperity begin. Manasseh is born, and Ephraim is born, but I love timelines. And so right there, Isaac dies. He lived from the year 2048 to 22. 28 from Adam. With that said, let's stand and we will pray. And then we'll have uh, about 15 minutes of uh, break, 15 minutes of worship, and we'll come back and we'll teach you the second lesson. Avinu Mokeno, our Father King, we just thank you so much. Your word is so alive today. It's so rich today. It's for us today. It wasn't just for back then. It was for us right now to learn and to understand biblical Torah principles. And I pray, Lord, you would open all of our hearts to hear what you are trying to teach us in these final days. Father, I want to thank you so much for all of those that are watching online, all of those that are here locally for wanting to be a torch for your honor. It's all about your honor. It's all about your glory. And I thank you for everyone who wants to honor you with their tithes and their offerings. It's all for you. It's not for us. We're trying to build your kingdom, not ours. And we just thank you so much for all of those who, who love you with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, and they want to be a light 
in this dark hour. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. Don't forget to sign up for the Hanukkah party or for the book. Now, the second half, what I want to talk about is Hanukkah. Uh, many people have never really studied or know anything about Hanukkah. How many of you have never been to one of our Hanukkah parties? Okay, we have some. Well, you want to come to our Hanukkah party for a lot of reasons. But one reason to keep Hanukkah is because it's about the rededication of God's temple. If you believe you are God's temple, it's time to be rededicated. There's nothing wrong with rededicating yourself. It's also about being persecuted for righteousness sake. We don't get persecuted unless we're doing righteous. It's also not about hiding your light under a bushel uh, because the Torah is the light and it's about championing the light. Prophetically, Hanukkah will happen again. The problem with much Christian thinking, everything is a Greek linear prophecy fulfilled, checklist done, it won't happen again. That's not biblical thinking. Biblical thinking is circular. If it's happened, it will happen again. It may be from a different perspective, like looking at your house on the ground from looking at your house in an airplane, but it's going to happen again. Think of those old toy slinkies, okay? And as we go around every year, we're seeing life just like winter happens every year, but every winter is different. Well, prophetically, things always happen, and then they happen again. Don't I mean, you're all millennialists, some of these goofballs. They think, oh, it's happened. It happened. Can't happen again. No, it's happened, so it will happen again. It's just the opposite. And believe it or not, Yeshua kept Hanukkah as well. Yes, he did. We'll look at that. But the main thing is Hanukkah is biblical. A lot of people don't keep Hanukkah just because they say it's Jewish. Well, that's very anti-Semitic. Okay? It is biblical. Now, here's the word Hanukkah in Hebrew up at the top. Uh, you can see the chet ha nu ka. Well, there's different ways to spell it in English, and it doesn't matter. They're both right because they're both wrong, too. It doesn't matter. All you're doing is using English phonetics to spell a Hebrew word. But Hanukkah means dedication. That's what it means. Uh, as a matter of fact, the number eight in Hebrew and the concept of dedication basically uh, is the same thing. In Hebrew, the word for oil has the same root as the number eight, which is why the whole story of the eight days of Hanukkah and the oil come together. Uh, how many of you have heard of Enoch? Enoch is the same word for Hanukkah. Enoch, okay? And Enoch means to train, to instruct. And so we find in the story of Hanukkah, there's a lot of teaching and there's a lot of, a, of uh, training. Okay, did you know Hanukkah was in the time of Moses' tabernacle? What? Yes. Take a look here. Numbers 788. This was the dedication of the altar of the temple. What's the Hebrew word for dedication? Yeah, they Hanukkahed Moses' tabernacle. They dedicated it. Matter of fact, look at Solomon's temple in 2 Chronicles 7, 8, and 9. At the same time, Solomon kept the feast seven days of, uh, and all of Israel with him, a very great congregation from the entering in of Hamath to the river of Egypt. And on the eighth day, they held a sacred assembly for they observed the what? The Hanukkah of the altar. They Hanukkahed Moses' tabernacle. They Hanukkahed Solomon's temple. And now in Ezra and Nehemiah's day, when it's been destroyed and they're rebuilding the temple, it says here in Ezra 6, it says in the first year of Cyrus, the king, the same Cyrus, the king, made a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. And he said, let this house be built, the place where they offered sacrifices, and let the foundation be strongly laid. Also let all the gold and silver vessels of the house of God that Nebuchadnezzar stole out of the temple, which is in Jerusalem, be brought from Babylon, uh, be restored back and brought again to the temple in Jerusalem. And it says the children of Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the children of the captivity kept the Hanukkah of this house of God with joy. Wow, they Hanukkahed Moses' tabernacle. They Hanukkahed Solomon's temple. They Hanukkahed the rebuilt temple. As a matter of fact, this Thursday night, 
is Erev Hanukkah, the 24th day of the ninth month? Well, look at Haggai 2, verse 10 and 11. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priest concerning the law. And it says on that same day, Haggai 2, 18, Consider now from this day and upward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Do you see that? The foundation of the temple was laid at Hanukkah. Haggai 2, 20 through 22. Again, the word of the Lord came to Haggai on which day? The 24th day of the month. And he said, tell Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, God is saying, I'm going to shake heavens and earth. I'm going to overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen. You know what? I would not be surprised if when God shook the heavens happened on the 24th day of Kislev. I really believe when these prophets have these dreams and they mention the day, there's a good chance it's going to happen on that day. So be watching for a shaking of this Hanukkah or the next one. Okay, then what happens? It's now the year 30. And look at John 10. It says in verse 22 through 24, it was the feast of dedication. Well, guess what? If you don't know Hebrew, you don't know. What's the Hebrew word for dedication? It was the feast of Hanukkah, but most Christians have no clue. They think it was something else because they don't know dedication is Hanukkah. In Jerusalem, and it was winter. And when's Hanukkah? In the winter. Jesus was walking in the temple in Solomon's porch, and there the Jews surrounded him and said, how long do you keep us in doubt if you are the Messiah? Hanukkah is the time to decide if he's the Messiah or not. Do you know Yeshua was conceived at Hanukkah? Noah's flood stopped in the middle of Hanukkah, and the rainbow came. Hanukkah is an incredible season. Do you know? Oh, so this Thursday night is Hanukkah. Even though it starts this Thursday night, next Sunday night at 5 p.m. at our office, we are going to Party, party. So if, if you want to come, come uh, this Sunday night to our Hanukkah party. As I said, we'll have all kinds of fun and prizes and games. But it starts this Thursday night. And if there's anyone here who's never kept Hanukkah, if you come in during the week next week, we will give you a Hanukkah and candles. Plus, we have a handout on the table about how to celebrate Hanukkah every night, what scriptures to read. That's also on that table over there. Now, how many of you remember the story of Daniel when he has a vision of a ram with two horns, which represent the Medes and the Persian, and then comes along a big he-goat with a big horn in the middle, and that's Greece. Does everyone remember that? Okay, well, let's jump in here a minute and look at Daniel 8, 3 through 11. He says, I lifted my eyes, and behold, there stood before the river a ram with two horns, which represents the Medes and the Persians. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. I saw the ram pushing west and north. Why? Because if you look at a map of the Medes and Persians, the Mediterranean Sea is to the west. So he's pushing west and he's pushing to the north. But Greece is on the east and or the west, and he's going to push east against the ram. And then it says, um, let's see, the ram is pushing west and north and south, and no beast could stand before him, neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, behold, a he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth, and he touched not the ground, and the goat had a big notable horn between his eyes. He came to the ram that had the two horns, which I saw standing before the river, and ran into him in the fear of his power, and I saw him come close to the ram. He was moved with color against him and smote the ram and broke his two horns, and there was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground, and he stomped on him. And there was no one that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Then the he-goat became very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And who was the great horn? Alexander the Great. Oh, my goodness. It's right there. And in its place came up four outstanding ones. Who were the four outstanding ones? His four generals. Okay, so right here, if you look at this PowerPoint, you have, these are the, his generals, Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus, where the Seleucids came from. So here's his four horns representing his four generals. And then it says, out of one of them came forth a little horn, which became very great. So let's show that one up here now. 
the Seleucid one is gone, and now it's Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus is the little horn that came from the Seleucids that ended up becoming very great. And it says, uh, it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stomped on them. He magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away and the place of his sanctuary cast down. Okay, let me just show you this one. Okay, here is where most of Hanukkah started, is in a little town called Modin, which is almost halfway between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. That's where this story that we're going to be looking at takes place. Now, here's something I want to show you. When it talks about he cast the stars to the ground and stomped on them, that's just like when it says up here where uh, the, no, the goat stomps on that guy. Well, let's look at this. Genesis 22, 17, God says, Abraham, in blessing, I'll bless you, and in multiplying, I'll multiply you, your seed as what? The stars of heaven. And what did he say to Isaac? Genesis 26, 4, I will make your seed to multiply as the stars. What did he, Joseph say in Genesis 37, 9? He said, I had another dream. The sun and the moon and the 11 stars made obeisance to me. So when it talks about him, Casting the stars to the ground, he's talking about defeating Israel. Israel is represented by the stars of heaven. Okay, so now let's go to 1 Maccabees. It says there sprang from this sinful offshoot Antiochus Epiphanes, the son of King Antiochus. He's Antiochus the fourth. Now, do you know what Epiphanes means? It means God manifest in the flesh. Like, oh, I've had an epiphany or something. So, here, Antiochus Epiphanes thinks he is God in the flesh. The Jews called him Antiochus Epimenes, which means a crazy man. Okay, and it says, in those days, look at this, there appeared in Israel transgressors of the Torah who were seducing many, and they said, let us go make a covenant with the heathen all around us. Ever since we separated from the Gentiles, many evils have come upon us. The proposal was agreeable. Some from among the people promptly went to the king, and he authorized them to introduce the ordinances of the Gentiles, whereupon they built a gymnasium in Jerusalem, according to the Gentile custom. What does that mean? The Olympics have been going on for centuries, and this was the Olympiad. It was the 145th Olympiad, I believe, and that is where they do all their Olympics without any clothes on. That's what they were doing. And so the Jews says, we want to do that, and then they go, oh, no, they'll see we're Jewish. And so they tried to undo their circumcision. Okay, so look at what happens here. Jeremiah 44, verse 16 and 17. Here they said, ever since we stopped doing what the Gentiles do, all these evils came upon us. So let's go back and do what the Gentiles do. Well, several hundred years earlier in the book of Jeremiah, we find, as for the word of the Lord that you have spoken, this is what Israel is saying to Jeremiah, he says, uh, as the word that you spoke to us in the name of the Lord, we're not going to listen to you. We will certainly do whatever thing comes forth out of our own mouth. We want to burn incense to the queen of heaven, pour out drink offerings to her as we have done. We, our fathers, our kings, our princes in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil. So in their mind, as long as they were worshiping what the Gentiles worshiped, everything was great. So look what happens in 1 Maccabees 1, 54 through uh, uh, 1, 41 through 50. Then the king wrote to his old kingdom that everyone should be one people, one world church, one world government, one world religion. Uh, bad news. He said they should all abandon their own particular customs. Okay. Even their own particular gender now. It says all the Gentiles conform to the command of the king. And many Israelites delighted in his religion, and they sacrificed to idols. They profaned the Sabbath. And the king sent letters by messengers to Jerusalem and to the cities of Judah, ordering them to follow the customs foreign to their land. They had to prohibit their burnt offerings, their sacrifices. They had to profane the Sabbath and the feast days to desecrate the sanctuary, to build pagan altars and pagan temples and shrines, to sacrifice pigs and unclean animals, to leave their sons uncircumcised and to defile themselves with every kind of impurity and abomination so they might forget the law and change all of its ordinances. 
And whoever refused to act according to the command of the king was to be put to death. Now, can you imagine when they start coming for your Bibles and they say, give me your Bible or we'll kill you. Okay, first Maccabees 1, 54 through 57. Now, on the 15th day of the month of Kislev in the year 145, that time calendar is the Olympiads. This was the 145th Olympic event. The king erected the desolating abomination upon the altar of burnt offerings in the surrounding cities of Judah. They built pagan altars. They burned incense at the doors of the houses and in the streets. And any scrolls of the law that they found, they tore up and burnt. Whoever was found with a scroll of the covenant, whoever observed the law was condemned to death by royal decree. Wow. Look what's coming. Look at 1 Maccabees 1, 62 through 64. It says, there just so happened to be many in Israel who were determined and resolved in their hearts not to eat anything unclean. They preferred to die rather than to be defiled with food or to profane the Holy Covenant. And they did die. And very great wrath came upon Israel. The officers of the king in charge of enforcing the apostasy came to the city of Modin to make them sacrifice. Okay, that's where I just showed you on the map. Okay, so what happens? Many of Israel joined them. But Mattathias and his sons drew together. And so then the officers of the king addressed Mattathias. Why? Because he was a big shot in the city of Modin. And it says, well, Mattathias, you're a leader. You're an honorable and great man in this city. Does that sound like flattering? Of course. Supported by sons and kindred. Come now, you be the first to obey the king's command as all the Gentiles and Judeans and those who are left in Jerusalem have done. In other words, conform, be like everybody else. You don't want to be separate. And then he says, then your so you and your sons will be numbered among the king's friends. And you and your sons shall be honored with silver and gold and many gifts. But Mattathias answered in a very loud voice. And he says, although all the Gentiles in your realm obey the king, so that they forsake the religion of their own ancestors and consent to the king's orders. Yet I and my sons and my kindred will keep to the covenant of our ancestors. Heaven forbid that we should forsake the law, the commandments. We will not obey the words of the king by departing from our religion in the slightest degree. And as he finished saying these words, a certain Jew came forward in the sight of all to offer a sacrifice on the altar in Modin according to the king's order. Mattathias would have none of it. When he saw him, he was filled with zeal, and his heart was moved out of his just fury, was aroused, and he sprang forward, and he killed the man right on the altar. At the same time, he also killed the messenger the king has sent, who was forcing them to sacrifice, and he tore down that altar. Thus, he showed his zeal for the law, just as Pincus Phineas did with Zimri, son of Salu. And then Mattathias cried out, and in the city, let everyone who is zealous for the law and all who stands for the covenant follow me. And then he and his sons fled to the mountains, leaving behind in the city all their possessions. Okay, what I want you to think about is during the time of Hanukkah, around 168 BC, Mattathias was a Levite, okay? And what did his sons do? They fled to the mountains. They hid in the caves, it says. And they left behind everything that was in their house. They didn't take time to go home and get their possessions and then flee. Now, I want you to remember that. And so now look what happens. In 1 Maccabees 2, 32 through 41, the enemy hurried up after them, and having caught up with them, they camped opposite and prepared to attack them when on the Sabbath they're going to attack them. And the pursuer said to them, enough of this. Come out and obey the king's command and you will live. But they replied, nani, 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 we're not going to. And so it says, we're not going to come out, nor will we obey the king's command to profane the Sabbath. So the enemy attacked them at once, but they did not profane the Sabbath. They did not even retaliate. They just stood there. When they came into the caves to kill them, they let them kill them. And it says the enemy attacked them at once, but they did not retaliate. They didn't even throw stones. They didn't block up their secret refuges. They said, let us all die in innocence. Heaven and earth are our witness that you destroy us unjustly. So the officers and soldiers attacked them on the Sabbath, and they died with their wives, their children, their animals, to the number of a thousand people died, and they never even defended themselves. 
And so what happens when Mattathias and his friends heard what happened, they mourned deeply and they said to one to another, if we all do as our kindred have done and don't fight against the Gentiles for our lives and our laws, they will soon destroy us from off the earth. So it was on that day they came to the decision that they can fight on the Sabbath so that we may not all die. That is a day, big day in history for Judaism because that was the day they finally decided you can fight on the Sabbath if that means you're trying to save the Sabbath and our laws. Okay, so Hanukkah is when? In the winter, and this big event happened on the Sabbath. Put that in the back of your head. Okay, Josephus, Antiquities of the Jews, in book 12, chapter 6 and 7, it says, now it so fell out that these things were done on the very same day on which their divine worship had fallen off and was reduced to profane and common use after three years of time. So in other words, this happened on Hanukkah, and exactly three years later was Hanukkah, the temple was rededicated. And it says here that um, after three years' time, for so it was that the temple was made desolate by Antiochus, and it continued for three years. And this, now this is important, this desolation came to pass according to the prophecy of Daniel, which was given 408 years before. Do you hear that Hanukkah story was fulfilled from the book of Daniel's prophecy? Does everyone see that? Josephus is saying Daniel's prophecy was fulfilled exactly as he said. Okay, so now let's look at Daniel 11, 31 through 33. And it talks about Antiochus and says his arms will stand on its part. They will pollute the sanctuary of strength and they will take away the daily sacrifice and they will place the abomination of desolation. And then it says such as do wickedly against the covenant, he's going to corrupt by what? Flatteries. But the people that know their God are going to be strong and do exploits. They that understand among the people will instruct many. Yet they'll fall by the sword, by flame, by captivity, and by spoil many days. Okay, now, if I mention to you Hebrews 11, what's it known as? The faith chapter, right? And you know, in Hebrews 11, there's not one Christian mentioned. Uh, surprise. Let's look at it. Hebrews 11, 32 through 38. What more shall I say? But the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith, they always believed it was through faith, subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, and out of weakness were made strong. They waxed valiant in fight. They turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Yea, more for, moreover, a bond and imprisonment. Look at this. They were stoned. They were sawn in half. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. And they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world wasn't even worthy. And look at this. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. That's speaking about the Maccabees. This is speaking about all the faithful during Hanukkah. Now, but I'm going to surprise you. When I tell you Matthew 24, what is Matthew 24 all about? End times. And guess what? It's really about Hanukkah will happen again. Look at this. When therefore you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by who? Daniel the prophet. Well, that's what Josephus had said back then. And now it's happening again. It says, stand in the holy place. Whoever reads, let him do what? Understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains like the Maccabees did. Let him which is on the housetop come down, not down to take anything out of his house like the Maccabees did. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Woe to those who are with child, to them that give suck in those days. But pray your flight not be in winter. When's Hanukkah? Winter. Neither on the Sabbath day. What happened on the Sabbath day back then? For then will be great tribulation, which was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor, nor ever shall be. So Matthew 24 is about the events of Hanukkah happening again. Does everyone see that? Now, here is the big closing question. 
You remember we've been talking about Amalek. Who was a type of Amalek? Haman, which is the book of what? Esther and Purim. Kill all the Jews. But now we're dealing with Antiochus Epiphanes. What is the difference between Haman in the book of Esther and Antiochus with the story of Hanukkah? Haman was about annihilation. Antiochus is about assimilation. Hitler was the Haman in our generation. So now that's been fulfilled in one sense. Now we're about to face the Antichrist who is like Antiochus. He doesn't want to kill you. He wants you to assimilate. But if you don't assimilate, he'll kill you. So what's going to happen? The Antichrist is going to tell everybody, all the Christians, you can keep your Jesus. Keep your Jesus. Put him in your pocket. Pull him out when you want. Just accept this idol over here. And all the Christians are going to think, well, that's great. I can keep my Jesus. Sure, I'll worship this over here. He'll forgive me. This is why the deception is going to be so strong in these last days. Because the Antichrist isn't going to come out to kill you. He'll just kill you if you don't assimilate. Keep your Jesus, but just add this one to your collection. That's what's going to happen. And people are going to say, oh, Jesus loves me. This I know. I said the magic words and twirled three times and clicked my heels, so I'm in. You know, so all I got to do is I can take this idol because I'm covered by blood and they're going to assimilate. That's what's scary about these last days. And so we don't want to get assimilated. All right. We, we can't think that, hey, it's all good. I got my Jesus still. It's not going to work that way. And, and we're going to see things happening, I believe, this next year. So we need to be ready. With that said, let's stand.